Hey everybody. Well, it's great to be here. This is uh, my, my first Odev, and boy, you've got a full house. This is very impressive. Um, so, let's see. I need to swap computers here. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. So uh, feel free to tweet about this, and that's uh, and false in on Twitter. So let me give you a little background. Uh, you saw that habitat background, and I thought that was going to be appropriate because it. Well, I'll, I'll get into it in my talk, but it's hard to to look at that today and you know realize how cutting edge it was at the time. Uh, I don't know. You know, I'm sure some of you are. Uh, long-time developers like myself, uh, that was running, that was actually the world's first uh, massively multiplayer graphic world uh, several years before Ultima Online and others became very popular. And it was a little bit uh, too far ahead of its time, unfortunately. Uh, Quantum Link that was mentioned was the only network that it ran on. It was specifically for Commodore 64 computers. The, the guy who ran Quantum Link said, you know, this is okay, but I, I'm going to start some new thing called America Online. I think that might do a little bit better. And uh, that was running on Commodore 64s. There were one megahertz processor, had 64K of memory in the whole computer. And uh, we had 300 baud modems. That's basically 30 bytes a second of data going back and forth. So imagine trying to support uh, you know, an online world and wasn't able to have more than uh, six avatars in one place plus uh, a much larger number of people who could observe any given area. Uh, but that was actually amazing for the time, and nobody really believed that it could be done, except for, I think, Chip Morningstar, who was our, our chief architect on that. But it was a great project, and there's a lot to learn fr from what's happened, and that'll be part of my topic as we, we dive into this today. I've worked in uh, a lot of different places over the years. I actually started uh, in the games industry in 1980, and you know, it's been interesting at that point there were a lot of people that thought, you know, much like what happened with Habitat, maybe it was a little bit too early in this, you know, computer game, video game thing. I don't know. Uh, my, my mother was very concerned that I was getting into this, this industry that wasn't an industry at the time, it was more of kind of a hobby and, you know, what would happen if that didn't work out. And I told her I could go back to doing accounts receivable programming on computers. And she thought about that and she says, well, I guess computers probably aren't a fad. So she, she gave me the blessing on that. But I, um, I wonder, does anybody know uh, any hands of, of uh, people who recognize that character at the top left, uh, the, the spiky-headed guy? Okay. So that's Sinistar. That was an arcade game that I worked on back in 1982. It was the first uh, published game that, that came out that I worked on. But I spent years at Lucasfilm uh, and uh, was one of the first few employees there, as well as uh, it later became LucasArts Entertainment. And then I was with the 3DO company, the, the world's first uh, disc-based, uh, CD-based uh, game system, game console. Uh, I was one of the first few employees at DreamWorks Interactive as well. But I also was a consultant for many years, a, a freelance designer and producer, and got to do a lot of different things. Worked on a number of entertainment titles, uh, but also worked increasingly in an area called neurogaming, which is going to be one of the topics that I'll get into today. And it's something that I think has a really bright future. I also was uh, chief game designer at Google for uh, four years, up until just this last April and uh, have had some experience with both augmented and virtual reality because of the, the work I did there. So that's just a, a little background to give you a sense of, of where I've been. Some of these games that you see up here, particularly in that lower uh, quadrant, I'll, I'll be talking about in a bit. But the core thing I wanted to talk about here is, you know, making, you know, it's a keynote. I wanted to, to make some, some bold uh, predictions here, but I'm also a little bit scared because forecasts have a way of, of going wrong. And even when something seems really exciting and possible, sometimes it takes a lot longer than you think. And that's kind of the category that I wanted to get into here, and that uh, I grew up on science fiction, and I, I love the way that things have developed with film in particular. Uh, there's a couple of movies here, uh, The Matrix, obviously a classic one, 
And uh, just on the flight over here, I saw a Ghost in the Shell for the first time on the plane. And uh, that's actually not from the movie, I believe, but uh, from uh, some of the other uh, fan work that's been done on that. I think that's somebody cosplaying. Uh, but that idea of being able to plug into a computer and just have you know, our brains be connected to magically fill it with information to have essentially telepathy, to you know, enter a virtual world that's completely realistic. It's been a, a great dream. And I, sad to say, I, I'm not absolutely sure it's gonna work that way. When I, when I see this kind of thing, particularly the Matrix, where they kind of went out of their way to have this gigantic spike going into his head that looked very uncomfortable, um, I think that it may be a little bit like when we look back at this, I, I was digging around and this is the first illustration I found of somebody talking about what a journey to the moon might be in the 1600s. And they thought, well, um, you know, maybe wild swans can take us there. Swans are, are big and strong and we hook enough of them together, you know, probably what about nine is enough to lift a person should be a problem. And uh, you know, then we got a little sail for steering, that, that should work just fine. And we'll get to the moon in a few days. Well, you know, it seems pretty quaint now. Uh, even several hundred years later, things uh, progressed. You know, Jules Verne actually was amazingly prophetic in a lot of the stuff he did. He said, well, you know, the fastest way to get from one place to another is a cannonball. Let's, what if there was a giant artillery piece and, you know, we were able to put people into the, the shell of the artillery piece and fire them at the moon. And then you've got a couple images on the right from a 1905, one of the very early uh, films that, that was done that was actually based on that concept. A little bit tongue-in-cheek, as you can see. But that was just Jules Verne using the best technology of the day. You know, of course, the acceleration to fire you out of a, a cannon would crush everybody on board, and, you know, long before you had a, a chance to accelerate fast enough to get to the moon. And, uh, you know, it was still, it was, it was pretty impressive. He actually decided, well, let's say, where would they, they launch to the moon? Uh, Florida seems like a really good spot. So he, he got some things pretty, uh, pretty accurate there. But the fact is, it's a dangerous business and it's very easy to take the technology of the day and think that, oh yeah, things will probably be like this in another 100 years, 200 years. So that sort of plugging in, using, using your brain like a computer, sounds good, but I don't know. I, I have questions about that. Yet another case, something dear to my heart, is uh, I saw the, the movie 2001 uh, when I was just a kid. And I thought, this is great. By the time we get to 2001, I'll be able to go up to the orbital Hilton. Maybe, you know, if I'm, I'm uh, a scientist or wealthy enough, I can go to the moon base or one of these, these cool places. But 2001 came along, and it was pretty disappointing, frankly. You know, we're, we're still working on the space travel. And we had Hal, who, uh, you know, compared to, to Alexa or Google Assistant at this point, um, still outclass them completely in his ability to, to talk and be very intelligent. But what's interesting is there's one little detail in that movie that they got wrong in the wrong direction. Uh, so it, after 2001, in fact, as they're traveling to Jupiter, uh, he plays, uh, Dave the astronaut plays a, a game with Hal, a, a computer game with a sentient computer. And what is it? Well, it's chess and it's a little 2D, uh, looks like a four color screen. And by 1988, uh, long before 2001, we had things like battle chess that uh, frankly looked a lot better than what he was doing there. And if I was stuck in a spaceship for a couple of years, I'd, I'd want something at least uh, a little bit better than 2D chess to play. So sometimes people get it wrong in one direction, sometimes they, they underestimate where things will go. A lot of times new technology, I find this analogy uh, just resonates with me we're going through a mountain pass, and maybe the mountain pass is only going to end in some, some small cul-de-sac, maybe a tiny valley with nothing of interest. Sometimes a whole continent opens up. And it's really exciting not knowing with technology. You know, in the 30-plus the years that I've been doing this, actually uh, getting on 38 years that I've been in the games industry, and uh, 40 since I started programming games uh, at my university, uh, I've seen lots of technologies come and go. Some seem very promising, didn't make it. Others seem like they really weren't all that impressive and yet went on to become incredibly important. Uh, Habitat was an interesting case in point where we really believe that that kind of multiplayer uh, playing over a computer would be a big thing. Uh, Chip, who I mentioned before, actually used the term avatar for the first time 
Uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia that there, there was some debate about who came up with that idea of using this old uh, term from, from uh, I think, the, the Hindu religion uh, to talk about controlling a character in uh, a virtual world. But it was uh, you know, clearly ahead of its time then, and there was a, a period around 1990 where a lot of people said, oh yeah, this is just not going to work, it's too expensive, it's too complicated, computers aren't fast enough, but of course all those things changed. Sometimes, though, you get through that mountain pass and you find that you're, you're stuck somewhere, you know, that you could see there's this wonderful valley and all sorts of possibilities, but you just can't get there from here and you have to kind of go back and find another way there. That, that happens actually quite, quite often as well. One of the examples was uh, Nintendo's Virtual Boy, and it, uh, yeah, it was about as silly as it looks here and really terrible. Uh, I only actually saw a demo of one because uh, nobody really wanted to buy it. I, I don't know how many they sold, but it was kind of a disaster for Nintendo at the time. And Nintendo, of course, takes lots of chances. It's a, a, a company that's done really well. But every once in a while, you know, they made a misstep. And for a lot of us, virtual reality became something that, you know, sort of like fusion power. They're always promising it, but it's probably another 30 years away, and, you know, it's not something you really want to count on. And uh, that's one of the, the things that um, you have to watch out for when you're predicting new things. It's just sometimes it seems like it's never going to happen, and then around the corner it really does. So let's get back to this first thing about um, uh, plugging in your brain, you know, the idea that you could just plug in and in a matter of seconds, have something like martial arts, you know, basically blasted into your brain. It's, it's a wonderful concept. I'd, I'd love to see that happen. But there's a lot of reasons why I, I'm pretty skeptical about that. Um, absolutely in the short term, meaning, you know, the next 10, 20 years, and, and quite possibly uh, in the long term as well, that, that may look like those swans in terms of uh, what they thought was possible and what we think is possible. Every brain is a little bit different, uh, in some ways a lot different, but where the actual neurons are that control any given thought or memory or skill, it's not the same and not identical for, for each person and not, uh, doesn't even use skills in the same way. Where uh, the idea that some kind of electrical current could come in and even if it knew what to do, that all of those neurons, you think about if you learn a skill like a martial art that takes place over months and months, there are millions if not billions of neurons that are getting wired up there and not just wired to be on and off like uh, a, a digital machine, but actually making connections and making physical connections through your brain. I'm pretty skeptical that having a jolt of electricity would speed that up by, you know, 10,000 fold. And there's also the feedback loops between the way that your muscles and your brain and, and the nerves and the rest of your body work that doesn't feel like it would really work that well if you were just being blasted that way. And the fact is, with any of these things, once we set out to do something, we find, you know, dozens if not hundreds of reasons why it's actually much harder than we thought it was going to be in the first place. And often we find something else that's easier. You know, battle chess is a great example that, uh, you know, is, is more entertaining, more useful, uh, but uses a different type of technology than creating a, a sentient computer to be able to play a game with you. So, um, if you want to predict things, there are several tools, several things that i found have been uh, pretty useful over the, over the years. Certainly, one of the things is uh, understanding evolution, understanding how our bodies work, how our brains work. And as a game designer, I, I found it very helpful to know more and more about our history, and not just human history, but going back, you know, even to, uh, you know, most primitive organisms. It's always really interesting to sort of keep it in perspective of why do we do things the way we do? Why does our brain, our eyes, our, our perceptions work the way they do? Even what is the nature of consciousness? I, I won't be getting into that today, but uh, I think it's worth considering if you're trying to change the world in, in any uh, useful way. Neuroscience. In, in turn is also really helpful, not just how the brain works, but uh, what's going on with emotions and you know, how we're affected by the way that we perceive things. Uh, it's particularly apt when you're talking about uh, brain-computer interface. I think it's really helpful to be understanding neuroscience because, of course, that's, that's where we're going to be plugging into all this 
sort of stuff. And you learn from the past, not just the distant past, but uh, the technological past as, as what has worked and what hasn't worked. But I'm going to go back a really long time, uh, roughly a million years ago, back to, uh, we know that, that uh, people have had fire for at least a million years. And one of the things that we don't really know is when did language first appear? Uh, quite a few people, myself in included, think that early language probably is also about a million years old, but uh, it's a lot of the changes in your body that were reflected to la in language aren't really uh, preserved well in skeletal remains, and of course we, we don't have any recordings or other ways of telling what uh, people were talking about or, or even able to, to do in those days. But I like to think, you know, at some point, whether it was a million years ago or only, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 years ago, as some people think that language came around, whenever it did, it was, in a large extent, our first virtual reality. It was the first time that people were able to say, I had an experience, I saw something today, I, I imagined something today, let me explain to you what this is. You know, and this is something that is so fundamental that you know, by the time we're one year old, you know, just as we're barely being able to even walk, we're starting to talk as well. And that's one of the reasons why I think it probably goes back a very long time. And it's so fundamental to us that, you know, like a fish in water, we just don't, don't even notice how profound it is and how important it is. But here I am, you know, despite all of our new technologies, the technologies I'm using to show this, it's essentially one person sharing, you know, their imagination, their vision for what they see to a bunch of other people. And along the way, we've come up with a lot of new technologies that show it off. Uh, as long ago as 40,000 years ago, there were paintings, uh, cave paintings here, uh, this one is actually a, a mere 20,000 years or so old. And uh, I think that it's really quite amazing. My, my art skills are terrible. I could not uh, create something anywhere near as, as realistic or beautiful as this. And you can't tell just from this picture, but the artist found certain patterns on the rocks that reminded him clearly of this uh, uh, bison or aurochs or whatever it is, and use that as kind of a, a very simple 3D way to give it a little bit more of a sense of, of being there in body. And the pigments are beautiful even 20,000 years later. And realize that this was somebody who mixed these pigments, didn't have you know, jars or, or containers that were easy to, to, to use, at least you know, we, we didn't find pottery until you know, many thousands of years after this, uh, but was able to bring this deep into a cave by flickering torchlight, you know, create something that was beautiful and that has lasted for 20,000 years. That, you know, certainly the, the games I've worked on, the writings that people do, it, it's hard to imagine whether anything that people are doing now will be known again in another 20,000 years, and yet we've already had this from, from this person here. And this was a huge breakthrough in this idea of communicating images, because now he could not just say, I saw this great you know, creature and you know, I attacked it and this was its weak point. He actually could show people something that gave them a visual to, to give them an understanding of that. And of course, that progressed very rapidly through you know, the last uh, few hundred years as, as technology improved. Paintings became more and more realistic and people discovered perspective and you know, better pigments, better technologies. Uh, even in medieval times, they had shadow plays so they could start to do animation and have a story that was actually unfolding in motion. Um, I'm skipping over a lot of things, but uh, here's a couple of pictures from a museum in, in Girona, Spain, that uh, the one on the left there is a magic lantern. And that was uh, high technology uh, around 200 years ago for projecting. It was basically a slide projector, but uh, became something that you know, started in, essentially in theaters. And then eventually, uh, 30, 40 years later, there were home models for the more uh, expensive uh, versions for the wealthy. And then there were even cheaper versions that everyone could have. Similar kind of thing happened. That's about a 100-year-old uh, movie projector. Uh, weighs probably 500 kilos or so, and they would sort of set it up, and it was a major job to move it anywhere. So a lot of those early movies were kind of set pieces in, in you know, one location. But you know, there's a lot more of this technology that you can, you can certainly learn about. In uh, recent decades, more recent decades, you know, back in the 50s, there were attempts to try and give you as many senses as possible and try and put you into this virtual world. But, of course, it really wasn't until just the last few years that virtual reality finally seemed to be taking off and really working. 
Um, and I'm curious here, how many people have experienced uh, any type of VR, whether it's something from Google Cardboard on up to, to Vive? Great, so that's what I was expecting, the large majority of you. You do realize, I hope, that you go out into Malmo here and start asking people at random, and you're gonna find a very, very tiny percentage who've experienced that, and it's interesting because a lot of us have already become jaded and are saying, oh yeah, you know, maybe it's not gonna work this time either, you know, they haven't sold as many of them. But just realize that it's still getting out there for, you know, we're a very uh, unusual audience that way that we've seen this sort of thing. I had an experience, given how many hands went up, I, I bet there are a lot of you had a, a very similar experience. First time that I saw the, the modern versions of, of virtual reality was uh, something that was a, a tag room, as before they even called it, the Vive. And I knew it was going to be some kind of VR thing, and my expectations were fairly low because of things like the Game Boy and other stuff that I'd seen. But they brought me into a room, and uh, there, it was a pretty empty room except for a one small table that I, I, I came by and they put the headset on and said, and suddenly I was in a virtual space and I was amazed at how good the quality was. It still didn't look quite real, of course, but you know, much better than anything I'd ever seen before. But what really got me was when the person doing the demo, uh, who was actually uh, one of the, the leaders at uh, Google's VR group uh, at this point, said, okay, now pick up the controllers. And I said, well, I can't see the real world. He says, well, take a look to your left. And there in the virtual world, there was a table right where there had been a table when I walked into the room and there are two controllers on it. And I thought, oh yeah, I did see something on that table. And still kind of not believing, I, I went over and I still remember this moment when I reached and put my hand around the virtual image and there was a real thing in exactly the right spot. And you know, the hair on the back of my neck went up and it was like, hey, this is, you know, to quote Keanu Reeves, whoa, this is really gonna be something amazing. And a uh, similar experience when I was done with the end of that demo, uh, you know, I saw uh, stuff that I'm sure a lot of you have seen of, of those early demos and really impressive. Not a lot of depth there, but uh, you know, still a lot of promise. And I remember taking off the helmet and feeling like I'd been given these you know, amazing superpowers and suddenly you know, I was back in my own human body again really had an effect on me and it reminded me in fact of Habitat where we wanted to give people that sense of moving into a new world and uh, it's, it's a, it was a really amazing thing. Of course since then we've seen lots of other possibilities, uh, augmented and, and mixed reality and I won't get into specific definitions, I'm sure most of you are, are aware of that. But I certainly am a believer that within you know, the fairly near future, we will be at a point where we'll, we'll have some sort of glasses and we'll be able to mix the, the virtual world with the real world. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have seen some of the Magic Leap uh, uh, work and, and signed, literally, I think I've signed four or five NDAs with them, so I, I can't go into any more detail than that. But I am a believer. I also spent a year uh, wearing Google Glass uh, pretty frequently, and despite some of the skepticism about that, I just actually found that to be an amazing experience and a little bit like having some superpowers as well. So uh, I think we're going to be moving into that pretty quickly. Um, nothing plugging into our heads, but uh, maybe something living on top of them. There are a lot of challenges, though, a lot of things that I found particularly looking at, at augmented reality and mixed reality and something where you've got the real world and you want to add virtual characters and have them be situated and aware of the space around them, which is by some means, you know, some people, it's, that's the definition of mixed reality when the, the virtual uh, world knows where the real world is. Uh, some of the problems are that we're still at a point where we've finally been able to, to get processors, displays, fast enough, the, the uh, senses coming from, you know, you need less than 20 milliseconds from moving your head to being able to see the images move, and that's a maximum. If you, if you take longer than that, that's when you get into motion sickness, and it'd be great to get that much smaller, but it's really hard to, to shrink things to that kind of speed, even with the processors we have now. So often they're going flat out just creating the display. If you now also have to scan the world in real time, and process that information, inform the display to create the virtual images, and do all of that within 20 milliseconds, that's when we start to run into trouble. And there's certainly no reason that we can't get there eventually, but 
I don't think we're quite there yet. You know, another thing is that to really do a mixed reality, you want to be able to move around, go anywhere, and not have some cable connecting you to the wall. And that means that you're not plugged into a power source, you know, in the wall, which can be, you know, easily 100 times the, the power consumption of just a battery if you want the battery to last at any, any reasonable amount of time. And that means that, again, it's hard to get the processing fast enough. It's hard to use mobile processors that are both energy efficient and really fast. Uh, and there are a lot of problems just scanning the real world, and I've just listed a, a very few out there, but gets really complicated. So this is something that's good, but you know we've we've got some problems. And yet, you know, to look at what Habitat was showing us 30 years ago, we've really come a long way in just those 30 years. Um, we're at a point where people's phones are in their pocket and they can go off even in the middle of a, a, a presentation like this. It's, it's quite inc incredible. So Moore's Law uh, may have actually run its course and, and processors aren't getting fast as quickly as they used to, but it's uh, compensated by the fact that we've got you know, graphics processing units and other custom chips and, and uh, machine learning is actually helping us get faster and faster without actually having to run the processors faster. The sensors are getting better. There are all these different ways that I think that there's every reason to think we're going to continue to make really fast progress and things like mixed reality are going to get to us uh, very quickly. And games are a great place to start because if a game's a little clunky, you know, the, the uh, roughly um, uh, probably about uh, two frames a second frame rate you saw with Habitat wouldn't have been satisfactory in a movie. And you can imagine at Lucasfilm where in 1986 that was a state of the art for games, but they were doing some pretty spectacular special effects for films and the film people would kind of sneer at us and, and you know, say, hey, there's really not much chance that you guys are ever going to be as big as, as, as uh, movies. And uh, there were other people in the computer division alongside our, our games group like John Lasseter that said, yeah, I, I think there's actually something to this. We, we really have some potential there. So this sort of stuff can happen and, and not just with games, but entertainment is a great way to start. Um, but some of the other areas, I've been working a lot with Games for Health and uh, VR, uh, whether it's game or not for health, this is actually a picture from um, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital uh, in California. It's a, a boy who had some terrible burns on his arms and when they changed his dressings, the pain was so bad that he needed narcotics to basically calm down and they were giving him so much that they were starting to get really worried. But luckily, one of the doctors there was doing an experimental VR therapy, and by uh, playing a game that you could play only with your head tilt, so you don't need to actually use your hands, he was able to distract himself, and the very first time they put this on and tried it, he was able to go from the maximum amount of pain doses that they, they were giving him to actually none at all and still have the bandage changed. And uh, sometimes he got a little scared and they had somebody with him saying, you know, what are you doing now? Are, are, how are you, it, it's a, a sort of a skiing game where you're going down a, a ski, slope, ski slope. And as soon as his attention went back to the game, he didn't notice the, the pain from the, the wound changing. So very exciting stuff. A lot of other areas. Uh, attention seems to be a real sweet spot for games and VR to be able to, to modify that. Several of the things I've worked on over the years have been in that area. But stroke recovery, depression, addiction, uh, phobias and, and post-traumatic stress have been treated for years, in fact, with virtual reality. Even the last uh, kind of clunky versions of virtual reality from 10 or 15 years ago and lots more that's been going on. Uh, I'll go into a little more depth. How am I doing on time? Not too bad. So one of the projects that I worked on was something called NeuroRacer, and this was with uh, Dr. Adam Ghazali at UCSF. Uh, he was the, the head of brain imaging, is the head of brain imaging at in UC, University of California, uh, San Francisco. And he was working on the fact that as adults age, uh, our ability to multitask uh, in the area he was looking at was, for example, driving and being able to identify signs. You know, they're, if they're looking at a sign, they might drive off the road, or conversely, if they're concentrating on their driving, they might miss their exit. And uh, it turns out that we peak at about the age of uh, 23 or so, and then things start getting worse from there. And in fact, the decade from the time you're 23 to when you're 30, you lose more ability than in any other uh, decade following. So uh, something to think about. Um, 
But the good news is, NeuroRacer, uh, so Adam talked to, to myself and a few other people that all happened uh, almost coincidentally to have worked for Lucasfilm at different times and uh, it created this very simple game. You can see some of the screens from it at the upper right there, so uh, both sides. It's just a very simple kind of computer racing game, uh, not elaborate by video game standards, but compared to what most neuroscientists work with where they might have like a little plus symbol and you move it into a box and now repeat that for the next half hour. And of course, after two or three minutes, people are so bored they're having trouble doing the task. This is actually a lot better. It's one of the ways that games help the neuroscientists. And in return, the neuroscientists are helping us understand what's going on because they've got uh, a, a high-level EEG going on. Uh, Adam also did some fMRI imaging of people's brains. And they did a, a full peer-reviewed uh, double-blind study. So some people were in a control group. Others came in to play the game and were tested again a month later and then six months later and there was both uh, single tasking of just doing driving or just doing signs and then doing both of those at once. And it turns out doing both of those at once was really critical. The results they got were really encouraging and I was able to bring people who were, you know, even in their 60s and 70s back to about the level of a 30-year-old. And as you can see from the, that red, green, and blue uh, thing there, the multitasking compared to the, the red control at the bottom or single tasking in green, you got huge increase in their skill level by doing multitasking. And what may even be much more exciting, six months later, without any more training on the game, most of that uh, improvement in their skill remained. So it, it hadn't just been a quick thing that wore off in a few hours. It really changed their brain. You can see this in the EEG and fMRI that the brain was responding differently after this multitasking training, and it was uh, uh, you know, able to keep that going. So that particular uh, venture, they started a company called Akili Interactive Labs, and they are hoping to get approval from the FDA in the US that approves uh, you know, drugs and devices and stuff. They've approved a number of devices and even some software and games for part of therapies that they use with helping people. But Achilles actually looking for a type of clearance where their software, their game, will be cleared on the same level as pharmaceuticals because in the initial tests that they've done themselves, they've had very encouraging results that suggest this can be prescribed just like a pill, but unlike a pill, you know, there are very minimal side effects and, uh, of course, a lot of people would much rather play a game than, than take medication. So they're hoping to see that. They're, the word from Achilles is that uh, they hope to hear by the end of this year, so sometime within the next two months, keep an eye on the news, and, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed for some good news there. Another thing that I'm really optimistic about driving VR forward uh, is uh, th something that I saw at uh, Google, something called Spotlight Stories. Uh, this particular one is called Pearl. And one more question, how many people here have heard of or seen some of the spotlight stories from Google, any of them? Yeah, not very many hands. It's very widely available. At the very least, you can watch them on YouTube, uh, but I would recommend that you watch them in VR, and they're available on uh, most of the, the systems out there. What's interesting about them, this particular one was nominated for an Oscar this year for a short subject and didn't win that, but did win an Emmy Award, so very good quality. And, and you know, this is not competing against just other VR, but is actually a VR movie that is competing against regular uh, short films, so that's, that's pretty impressive. Didn't use very high level, res high resolution graphics, uh, simple kind of cartoony graphics, but in VR, it actually comes to life in a way that, with my understanding of neuroscience, and, and of course I'm not a scientist, but my sense is that this is really uh, engaging uh, part of your brain called the amygdala, partly because in this story, you're seeing uh, a story unfold from the passenger seat of a car, and you're a very, in a very intimate space, and you feel very close to the characters around you. And I, I use that term in both senses, that you feel like you're physically you know, able to reach out and touch them. But that triggers a part of our brain that says, this person is in arm's reach. You know, I'm sure, particularly now that I'm going to bring your attention to it, that the people to either side of you, you're more aware of them than anybody else in the room, that we're hardwired to be very sensitive to stuff that's in our, our personal space around us. And virtual reality is a great job of affecting that. So. Um, 
another technology that gives me some hope for where we are able to go in the fairly near future is eye tracking. This is getting built into a lot of the headsets that will be coming out in the near future. And uh, it certainly gives you that ability on the software side to see with great precision just where someone's looking. Even with gaze tracking, which is essentially you using the VR headset to know which direction someone's looking, we've seen some really deep emotional connections. Uh, the, the VR movie Henry, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, Henry responds to you when you look at him, and there's something uh, very magical about that because, it, again, it's like real life, that in a movie, they have close-ups, they have characters staring at the camera, but not in response to anything you do. And working in the games industry, we're acutely aware that interactivity is totally different than a passive medium. They may look the same on a screen, but when you're actually doing something, it feels quite different than when you're just sort of sitting back and watching somebody else's story unfold. Those are both good experiences, but they're fundamentally different in the way that we perceive them. Um, but speaking of movies and eye tracking, you can get a sense from some of the science fiction of what it would be like when we have that level of eye tracking. It gives you this extremely fast thing. Our eyes are, are one of the fastest parts of our body. And of course, if we're processing information, the first thing we need to do is, is look at something and perceive it, have that part of our brain figure out what it's looking at, pass it to our conscious mind. But consciousness is actually pretty far back in the loop. And if you can catch where somebody's looking, you can actually predict with some accuracy what's going on in their brain, sometimes before they're even aware of what they're seeing. So that's really a very exciting area where I think that without having to plug into the brain, we can simply use technology that's available today and see where someone's looking, see where somebody's eyes, even their involuntary eye movements are taking them, and use that to help, uh, I, even with selection, there are some really interesting interface experiments I've seen using the speed of your eyes to select things that goes way faster than you can ever move a mouse. Because of course, to move the mouse, you see something, you move your eye to it, and then the signal says, yes, I want to actually select that, and you're moving your arm, and then you have to click with the button. And even though that, that can happen in about a quarter of a second, you could shave a lot of time off of that quarter of a second. And as I mentioned before, milliseconds matter in this kind of thing. But that's the input. Uh, what about the output? When you're clicking, there are muscles in your arm that are moving, and they generate a signal. And there are a lot of devices out there, well, a lot. There are a handful of devices, or I guess an armful of devices, that are just starting to come out now that will sense the electrical signals in your arm or actually in any part of your body. And it puts out a fairly complex signal, but uh, you can then use Fourier transforms and other types of analysis to figure out what's going on with individual uh, nerve patterns. And one of the great things about it, of course, is that if you're training one of these things, it's very easy to tell somebody, you know, all right, move this finger, move that finger, now spread them out. You can have that whole training thing happen fairly quickly. And even though, again, people's arms, just like their brains, are different, there's a little bit less difference there in the way that it works than in the way that your, your brain works, certainly a lot less complexity. And I'm very optimistic that this is going to be able to pick up a lot of information. And what that can give us, potentially, are things like being able to sense your motions uh, when you only move your finger a little bit, or possibly even when you just have the intention of moving your finger before it actually starts to move. And certainly, that time that it takes to push your finger down and make a gesture for a hollow lens or press an actual physical button, if you can just move it a fraction of that, again, we're saving those precious milliseconds. And potentially, you might get to a point where you could be texting simply by you know, moving your fingers or even by kind of twitching your fingers to a point where no one else can see it so that we get to that sort of telepathy that you think of where you're, you're using your heads-up display, you're getting the input uh, you know, and, and being able to, to select stuff with your eye and respond to it, not even just with your hand, but with the muscles and the nerves in your arm without having to move your muscles much at all. Uh, we're sort of getting to a, the ultimate couch potato there, I guess. But uh, I'm sure we'll find some really useful things to do with it. One of the first areas that's likely to take off, I think, is eSports, where, again, milliseconds matter, and now there are you know, uh, million-dollar uh, prizes that can be won. So shaving those few milliseconds off of somebody's response time every time they select or click something is going to be huge for that. Uh, but eventually, there's no reason why we can't have sensors over our whole body and not necessarily clamped around our arm. 
but built into our clothing so that it just becomes a very simple thing where you know, your, your body image uh, in a virtual world is very easy to, to capture because you're essentially in a motion capture suit the whole time that's not just capturing your movement but knows exactly what's going on inside your body with your muscles moving and probably is also modern, monitoring your health and all of that. So what this means, to kind of bring it back to where I started, is that I think we can actually skip the whole brain plug thing, which I think will, will be great for us because you know, I, I didn't mind shaving my head. I'm not so sure about all you know, the different kind of ports. And of course, as you see, there's a lot of uh, common ports there that we all know are changing every few years. And ripping out the old one and putting in a new one it doesn't sound quite so good. So I think there are a lot of advantages to this bypassing the uh, hardware kind of connection. It doesn't necessarily allow us to, you know, learn how to fly a helicopter or learn kung fu in a, uh, you know, a few seconds. But it is technology that's available now, or certainly within the next few years. And there's a lot of advantages to it. You know, I, I think our, our friend here will be, you know, equally amazed and gratified that, you know, he doesn't have to have that thing stuck into the back of his head. So to sum up. Predictions are pretty dangerous, but uh, I think that if you look at what uh, you understand of the way our brains work, how we've evolved, you know, get a sense of, of where we are and uh, what we're evolved to do to share information and, and how this is kind of a natural uh, path that we're on to this ultimate idea of being able to essentially have ESP or uh, I guess telepathy, I should say, where you know we can transfer those eyes, uh, those ideas about what we see and what we imagine to another brain, not necessarily just by talking or by putting up pictures, but possibly as directly as possible. Um, it is promising what we're seeing in, in virtual augmented mixed reality, but we still have a ways to go there. And happily, we've got things like games for health that are pushing some of those things forward where you, it's not depending on the entertainment market and people buying a bunch of headsets because hospitals are used to buying expensive medical equipment. Uh, a Vive and the computer to run it is actually relatively cheap compared to a lot of the stuff that they have in hospitals. And of course, that's getting cheaper all the time as well. Uh, VR movies, I think, are going to be a big thing even within the next few, few uh, years. Um, that's a subject for a whole different talk. Uh, but that's another thing that can help push the technology forward. And uh, the fact that you could jack in without having to drill through your skull is, frankly, I think, a, a big advantage. So this is just one small idea, but I thought it might be an interesting way to, to start out the next few days. So as you see these things in the next few days, lots of interesting talks about technology and where we're going. I'm sure you'll be seeing lots of demos of, of things that may seem you know, quite amazing and, and claims that, you know, are they possible, are they not? Think a little bit about what we're evolved to do, what we want to do, what's possible already, and uh, try and evaluate that. Be skeptical, but be optimistic. And above all, I'm a game designer. I think you should be having fun with all this. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be in touch with you, and uh, I'll be around for the next few days if people have questions or want to talk, and I, I've got another talk coming up uh, tomorrow. Thank you.